Good morning, Hannes Creek. I'm so glad that you decided to join us again this week, either on hannescreek.online.church or YouTube or Facebook. I'm excited about the service today, but I got a couple quick things to get out of the way. Number one, it looks like that we're going to be allowed to return to the building next Sunday, Mother's Day, May 10th. So I put out a video earlier that explained some of the precautions we're taking, and I'm going to keep putting that out on Facebook this week. But I want you to take a look at that. We're doing everything we can to minimize the risk of you being exposed to anything. We want to deep clean. We're going to use masks. We're going to use hand sanitizer. But I'm looking forward to seeing everybody in person. But just real quick, uh, the governor did kind of request that anybody 65 or older or feels immunocompromised, uh, they might want to stay at home. So just keep that in mind. Also, if you have a mask, you might bring a mask. But we're looking forward to seeing you. And then number two, through all of this, you all have been gracious to continue to give to Hannes Creek, and I'm so appreciative of that. If you're online with us at hannescreek.online.church, there's going to be a little button pop up right now. If you want to partner with us financially, hit that button, make a contribution, and know that we uh, are being the best stewards we can with your money and trying to impact not just the local area, but impact the world with your giving. So thank you for that. I'm excited. We have two familiar faces again today to lead us in worship. I want to encourage you to join in, sing with them, and then buckle in and get ready for a good word from, from God. I really feel like God's using this to speak to us and reveal more about Himself to us. Let's pray. God, thank You so much for giving us these kind of platforms uh, to utilize, to continue to spread Your Word, to continue to reach people where they're at. Uh, even when it's hard for us to come together because of restrictions, you've still made a way for us to continue to impact people. And we're thankful that we're impacting more and more people than we could have ever imagined. God, I ask that today that you would be with people, that you would speak through this message to people. Help them to see you and hear you, experience you. Change them, transform them, mold them and shape them into the people that you would have them to be. I pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name, the sun. It's time to sing our song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Like never before, oh my soul. 
We're going to jump right back into this sermon series where we're asking the question, who is Jesus really? And before we get into the meat of what we're going to talk about today, I just kind of want to go back a couple weeks and recap everything for those of you that may be joining us for the first time. So we started this series with this question, who is Jesus really? And it all revolved around this conversation that my wife had with my son about how he should treat his sisters. And my son's response was, Mommy, I'm going to need a lot of help with that. And Barbara said, Matthew, Jesus can help you. And Matthew's quick response was, I'm not even sure if he can help me. And I heard that story and I heard his response. And I also heard myself in his response at different points in my life. I've asked the same question, you know, who is Jesus? Can he really help me? And I know a lot of people have been thinking about this question and asking this question in light of this crisis that we're facing. So we plunged into this series as an attempt to answer that question. And I've built the whole series based off of a TED talk that I watched by a guy named Simon Sinek who talked about the Golden Circle. And the Golden Circle was a tool that Simon Sinek used to tell businesses how they should promote their products or their organization's brand. And the big point of the Golden Circle is that he always starts with the why. Because when you start with the why, you make connections, you build relationships with people. And you can tell them what and how later, but why is the most important. And that's where we started this series. If we're going to ask the question, who is Jesus really, we need to start with why Jesus? Why do we talk about Him? Why do we feel, feel like His words carry so much weight? And one of the things we saw right off the bat, it's because of who Jesus is, that's really part of the why we looked at some texts from the beginning of John chapter 1 and also Matthew and Luke's Gospel. And what we found was that John paints this pretty clear picture that Jesus really has no beginning. Uh, he says in the text, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we know that John is alluding to Jesus in that use of the word word, or the Greek word logos. Uh, so we see from John's perspective that Jesus was fully God. He was divine. He, he has always existed. He's uncreated. And then Matthew and Luke kind of give us this perspective from the human standpoint of Jesus. And they don't deny His uh, divinity. They, they acknowledge that He is God too. They both say that He was born from a virgin. But they're careful to highlight his ancestral lineage, both through his adoptive father, Joseph, and through his mother, Mary. And they're painting this picture that Jesus, while he's fully God, he's also fully human. And another text that we looked at was in the book of Hebrews, where we know that Hebrews tells us that Jesus was tempted and tried just as we are, yet he was sinless, he was perfect. And that's really why we look at Jesus the way we do to answer this question. Because He's fully God, because He's fully human, He relates to us as a human, but as God, He can redeem us. He can save us. So we started at the beginning of our series with the question, why Jesus? And we made this statement that Jesus has always existed. He has no real beginning. He's uncreated. And the beginning of the story is that God created the world and everything was working properly. It was functioning as it should. And Adam and Eve were happy people. Uh, they were living in God's blessing. They experienced walking with God in the garden. And we know that the world we live in today looks a lot different than that. The world we live in today is broken. And we, we experience things like anxiety and depression and worry and any type of illness, even this uh, virus. It's a form of brokenness. So what we see in the beginning and what we experience is completely different. And a glimmer of hope is the fact that God the Son, Jesus, inserts Himself into this brokenness. And that's really what we talked about last week. In the midst of this crisis, we have a heightened awareness of anxiety, of depression. Some of us that don't struggle with those mental illnesses in our lives have begun to experience it. And that really doesn't minimize the fact that we know a lot of people 
struggle with mental illness all the time. They struggle with depression, anxiety. And we saw last week that Jesus, uh, when we asked that question, who is Jesus really? Mark paints a pretty clear picture that one aspect of Jesus we have to understand that he, he is a physician. He, he's not only a physician, he is the cure. So Jesus inserts himself into this brokenness that we experience, and he diagnoses the problem. And, and he acknowledges the fact that while we struggle with illness and while we struggle with anxiety, while we struggle with worry and depression and things like that, those are really just symptoms of a bigger problem. And Jesus points us to the fact that the big underlying issue that causes these symptoms is sin. And Jesus says, I have come to fix that problem, to cure that cancer, that disease of sin. Now, the paradox of this is, is that some of us experience complete healing from anxiety and worry and depression or even cancer. But some of us are left with the symptoms. We know that the original, the big problems have been cured, but we have to deal with the symptoms still. And I told you I don't really have a good explanation as to why that happens, but I trust that God has a plan and has a purpose even in those things. So what we saw last week was that sick people need a doctor. Sick people need a doctor. Jesus comes and He addresses this brokenness. He, he re, recovers sight to the blind. He makes the lame walk again. He raises the dead. He heals sickness so we saw sick people need a doctor. And this week, we're going to really kind of take a, a turn on things, and it's really a challenge because what we're going to find this week is that while sick people need a doctor, religious people need a prophet and a priest. So there's the, there's the tie-in to all this. We, as preachers, we like to use words that start with the same letter to make it easier for you to remember. So we have Jesus the physician, the prophet, the priest, and then we'll go on from there next week. So Jesus, it's important to understand this, and I, and I want to really make sure I hammer this home right from the beginning. He's a prophet, but He's not just a prophet. And He's a priest, but He's not just a priest. And this is really what sets Christianity apart from some of the other religions that we know exist in the world. Other religions acknowledge Jesus and they acknowledge Jesus as a prophet, but they say He's just a prophet. And we say, no, no, Jesus isn't just a prophet. Jesus is a prophet, a priest, and we'll see next week He's a king, but we know He's God. We know that He rules. So, we're going to pick back up today in this circle, the second circle, the what circle. Because I think the prophet falls into this category of what. What is it that Jesus does? And then we're going to move into, a little bit later, the how. Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 21, really gives us a pretty clear picture of how Jesus fulfills that prophetic role. So if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to open those up, flip over to the Gospel of Luke chapter 4. If you're watching with us on hannascreek.online.church, uh, one of the things that you have at your disposal right there on the screen is there's a little tab that says Bible. You can hit that tab and you can pull up the Bible right there on the screen and follow along. So you can search right there for Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. Here's what Luke writes. Now, where we pick up in this narrative in Luke is just after Jesus is tested in the wilderness. And so this is when Jesus is entering into His ministry. His final three years of life are beginning now. So He goes to the wilderness for 40 days and fasts, and He's tempted, and He overcomes the temptation. And Luke picks up in verse 14 of chapter 4 by saying, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, 
to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture, scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So we have Jesus coming in from Galilee to Nazareth, which is where he was raised, where he grew up. And he goes into the synagogue. So this is the religious gathering of people. This would be uh, the, the same as our church. It's the Jewish church, the synagogue. This is where they gathered. And he's given a scroll to read. And the scroll that he's given is from the prophet Isaiah. And Jesus gets to pick from what we can tell. He gets to pick the passage that he reads from the scroll. So he picks a passage that really reflects the calling of a prophet. And here Jesus is, he reads Isaiah and he proclaims this, that God's calling this prophet and here's what's going to happen. And he says, this is fulfilled in your hearing today. In other words, he's saying, I'm a prophet. I've come to fulfill this. So it helps us to understand the role of the prophet for the people of God. And it's really not that difficult. The prophet was simply the mouthpiece of God. In the Old Testament, the prophet spoke on behalf of God. Now, when I was a young boy raised in church, you would hear this phrase a lot, thus saith the Lord. And that's really you know, how the prophet spoke. The prophet spoke, thus saith the Lord. He'd proclaim this message, and at the end he would say, thus saith the Lord. And the people understood that it really wasn't the prophet speaking, but it was God speaking through the prophet. So the significance of Jesus filling this role is huge. Because here's the setting. Here's the big picture of what's going on. Between the Old Testament period and the New Testament period, there is 400 years of silence. Which is fascinating when you think that the Israelites were bond, held bondage in Egypt for 400 years. Now we have 400 years of silence between the Old and New Testament, and Jesus bursts onto the scene. So in that 400 years of silence, God's people haven't heard from a prophet. They haven't heard the voice of God for 400 years. And here Jesus is standing in the midst of these people, reading this prophetic passage, saying, Hey, listen, I'm fulfilling this. And we can flick back to Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, and we'll find what kind of message Jesus proclaims as prophet. Here's what he said. Here's what Mark wrote down. After John was put into prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. So right there, that's what Jesus proclaimed, the good news of God. And then Mark quotes Jesus, and this is the good news. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So Mark says it's good news. He was proclaiming good news. Now notice what Jesus read from Isaiah. Freedom for prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, the oppressed are set free, pro proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor. And it sounds great. Those are all good things. But, but I want to take a look at the reaction of the people when they hear this. So we're going to pick back up at verse 22 in Luke chapter 4. Luke wrote, All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote, quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself, and will tell me, Do here in your hometown what you have heard that you did, what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, Jesus continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure, assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath, in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet none of, no, not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town, and took him out to the brow of the hill on which the town was built, in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. So what we, we see, at first, the people hear this good news and they're excited. 
freedom for the prisoner, recovery of sight to the blind, healing the sick. This is great. And they're really, really excited. And then something happens. They change their reaction because Jesus points out that like their ancestors, they weren't going to accept Him. See, Israel had this history of getting words from the prophet of God and they would kill Him because they didn't like what they had to say. So God allowed those prophets to bless people outside of Israel. That's what Jesus said. He said, Elijah wasn't sent to anyone in Israel. He was sent to a Gentile woman because you, you didn't accept Him. You didn't listen to what He had to say. So He went and blessed a Gentile woman. And the same thing about Elisha. There were many people in, in Israel that had leprosy, but Elisha was sent to a Syrian. And they're smart enough to realize that Jesus is saying, you're going to do the same thing to me that your ancestors have done for years and years and years. So at first glance, we say, why would they be mad? And the question to that, why would they be mad? Maybe a good logical answer is that I think they were kind of envious that they finally realized that God's offer of good news, God's blessing wasn't just for them. They realized that God was going to be blessing people outside of Israel and, and they were kind of envious. So they had these expectations of Jesus. And when they realized that He wasn't going to meet their expectations, they decided they wanted to throw Him off the cliff. And that's precisely why people struggle with the good news. Because the good news challenged their expectations and way of living out their religion. Jesus called them, the people in the synagogue, He called them to repentance. The people inside the community of Israel. And that word repentance, in, in the Greek language, it carries the connotation of a change of mind and will. So repentance includes our thoughts and our behaviors. So what we have here in this broken world is we have two, two kind of conditions of people. We have people that are broken, people that are hurting. And Jesus inserts Himself into that brokenness and He says, I'm here, I'm the physician, I'm the healer. And He has compassion on those people. Read about Jesus' response when He goes to raise Lazarus from the dead. Jesus knows He's going to raise him from the dead, but when He sees the hurt and the pain, the Bible tells us that Jesus wept. He was able to have compassion on people. And that's one condition. And then on the other side of the coin, you have this condition of these religious people that felt like they had it all together and they just wanted somebody to come and relieve them from Roman oppression. And, and they didn't think anything about their spiritual condition, but they're still experiencing brokenness. But Jesus comes to them as a prophet and He calls them to repentance. And that's when we start to move away from this what then to the how because when we start to make this progression away from brokenness and toward recovering this idea of goodness and what God has in store for us, it involves repentance. So we would say turn away and turn to. So remember, in this brokenness, we find a lot of ways to try to fix it ourselves. And I made a list. Sex, drugs, alcohol, career, fame, money. But I also said religion. We use religion to try to fix the brokenness. And Jesus enters into this brokenness. And for all of us religious people that think we have it all together, Jesus said, you need to be repenting. You need to be turning away from that self-righteousness and turning towards something else. And that's when we get to this idea that Jesus also comes as priest. And we'll look at that from the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 4. And I said, this is the text I used in the first sermon when we talked about Jesus as being perfect and sinless. This is what the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 4, verses 14 and 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. 
For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Now, Jesus enters the picture as physician, as prophet, as priest. And when we move into chapter 5 of Hebrews, we find a pretty clear picture of what the priest's role was in the community of God's people. So, verses 1-4 through of chapter 5. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God just as Aaron was. So right there we get a picture of what the role of the priest was and we get a problem with the priest. The role was that he was God's representative to the people and the people's representative to God. If the people wanted to come before God, they had to go through the priest and the priest had to offer a sacrifice to atone them of their sins so that they could relate to God. But what the text also tells us is that the problem was oftentimes the priest had sin in their life too. So the priest had to offer a sacrifice for their own sin as well as the sin of the people, to represent the people before God. And that's where Jesus is different. Jesus doesn't have to offer a sacrifice for His own sin because He lived a perfect, sinless life. And He's the perfect high priest. And He's the people's representation before God. And that's when we make the shift. of How does all this work together? How does Jesus fix the brokenness? How does He heal the hurt? How does He show grace to the self-righteous? It's because Jesus wasn't only the priest, He was also the sacrifice. That's what the cross is. Jesus, as the great high priest, comes in to represent the people to God. And because of His spotless, unblemished life, He lays down Himself as the once-for-all sacrifice for humanity and atones for the sin of mankind. If you skip down to Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, this is what the, the writer of Hebrews wrote. Son though He was, He learned obedience from what He suffered. And once made perfect, He became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey Him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of of Melchizedek. For those that are broken, Jesus comes as the physician and offers the cure. For those that are self-righteous, Jesus comes as the prophet issuing the call to repentance. So in all of this, sin separates all of us from God. Paul tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And because of that sin, because of of that curse in our lives, we're separated. We can't relate to God. We need somebody to represent us before God. And Jesus said, I'll go. I'll do it. I'm going to represent the people. Not only that, I'm going to die for the people. Because what happens when we sin against an almighty God, a just God, is that we become guilty. Legally guilty. And the penalty for the guilt, the penalty of sin is death. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. We all deserve to die. And Jesus said, but I'll die. I'll pay the penalty so that they can be proclaimed free. See, when Jesus said He came to set the captives free, it wasn't just talking about slavery. It was talking about all people that have been bondage to sin. He came to set us free by giving His life as a sacrifice. So what does that have to do with us? How can we apply this to our present situation? And this is where things get a little rough. 
you know, you can Google or you can watch the news, you can look at social media, and you can see how a lot of people, a lot of religious people are responding to this crisis. You, you can see people uh, saying that it's, it's a plague caused by God because He's, he's punishing people for their wickedness. You, you can see people say, well, this is something that God allowed to happen so that He can teach us something. And, and there, there may be little bits and pieces of truth in, in all of that. But one thing that's important for us church people to understand, it's easy for us to sit and be right, self-righteous and say, God's using this crisis to call this world that's full of a bunch of sinners to repentance. You know, one of the things that I kept coming back to this week as I read through these texts and as I really processed them myself is I noticed that the call to repentance that Jesus issued was most often issued to the religious elite. The call to repentance uh, wasn't so much offered to the brokenhearted. He, he did call them to repentance, but He did it in a much more gentle way. He first had compassion on them. He first healed their disease. And then when that was established, he did say, you know, this thing called sin is important and you should turn away from it and turn toward me. But Jesus' harshest words were reserved for the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the, the, the religious leaders, the holy people. Those are the people he calls brood of vipers. Those are, those are the people he calls hypocrites. Those are the people he says, repent. Repent. And when I think about that, you know, it makes me really, really take pause and do some self evaluation and think about my own life. You know, do I fall into the pit and the trap of self righteousness? Do I understand that I need God's grace every day just as much as anybody else? You know, maybe we can make sense of this pandemic from a couple different perspectives. I believe that there are people in this pandemic that are experiencing more heartache and more brokenness. And as a result of that, they can come to Jesus as a healer. They can experience the Son of God as healer in their life. They can experience His mercy, His compassion, His touch. And then I think the other perspective we can look at this pandemic from is that there, there are those that are experiencing the same pandemic, but through that we fail to do some self-examination. We look out and we find fault with everybody else and we say, look, God's using this to call you to repentance. But when we do that, we're not looking at our own lives. Could it be that we've fallen into the same trap that the religious elites of Jesus' day fell into? They constructed this system based on their own expectations. And when their own expectations weren't being met, they were infuriated. They became disgusted at who Jesus was. You know, there's this aspect of God allowing us to experience this pandemic to come into a better understanding of who He is. Maybe as the church, We've settled into this place that really wasn't the expectation that God had, but it was one that we had. So I want to challenge you this week to think about what has God taught you through this? How has He revealed Himself to you? Is He coming to you as a physician, healer? Is He coming to you as a prophet and priest and saying, hey, there's some things you need to repent from. There's some things you need to turn away from and turn back toward Me. It's time for self-reflection. It's not time to look and cast stones and judge the rest of the world, but what's happening inside of our own hearts. Because if we really want to impact this world through this crisis, we first have to get the inside right and allow God to use us. You know, there's more good news to come. Next week, we're going to move deeper into this how and we're going to start to go back again into the why and you're going to see how this whole thing comes full circle next week mother's day we're going to be back here in the building and i've been very very careful through this whole thing to never say back in the church because i don't believe we have ever left the church the church is where the people are 
So next week, we're going to be back in the building, and we're going to celebrate a return. And we're going to celebrate a king, and that's what we're talking about next week when we ask that question, who is Jesus really? So I want to offer this to you today. We have this idea in our minds that we have to repent one time and come to Jesus one time. And you know the reality is, it's a daily occurrence in our lives. We have to get up every day and we have to make a decision. Are we going to trust Jesus today or not? Are we going to turn away from sin? Are we going to turn away from the ways we try to fix brokenness and turn to Jesus or not? Some of us haven't done that for the very first time. Some of us have never come to Jesus and said, I just want to know who you are in your terms, not mine. And that's the invitation I want to offer you today. If you're on hannascreek.online.church, there's a little button that's going to pop up at the salvation moment. And I'm so thankful that last week somebody was courageous enough to hit that button. So last week, while some people thought the church was absent and sleeping, God used what we did at Hannah's Creek Online to bring one soul to salvation. And I'm confident He's going to do it again this week. I want you to hit that button and let us know that you're going to commit to Christ as Lord and Savior. And next week, we're going to find out more about what that means to commit to Him. Maybe there's some of you out there that have been a part of the church for a long, long time and you say, you know what, this whole thing about repentance and this whole thing about self-evaluation has really convicted me today. I want you to know that conviction is not the point. Uh, conviction is where it starts and then we have to get to this place of repentance and turning away, changing our behavior, changing our thoughts. You know, if that's you, go ahead and hit that button and let us know I'm going to recommit my life to Christ. And if I have your information, I'm going to reach out to you because I want to come alongside you and help you walk through this. But at the same time, I want you to know that I do that every day. I make a commitment every day. God, today I'm going to try to trust you. Today I'm going to try to turn more away from the ways that I try to fix things and turn toward the way you try to fix things. Would you pray with me? God, I'm so grateful that even the midst of, in the midst of this crisis, in the midst of all the brokenness that we experience, even when we're not in the middle of a pandemic, there's still brokenness that surrounds us every day. And in the midst of that, you have inserted yourself through your son, Jesus Christ, and you have made a way for us to turn away from the brokenness and turn back toward you and eventually recover. We can pursue and recover your original design, your intent, your purpose for life. God, I don't know how many people are watching this this morning. I don't know where they're at in their house, in their living room, in, in their kitchen, in their bedroom, wherever they're at. But I know that it doesn't matter where they're at because you're right there beside them. And I ask that they would feel your presence. I ask that they would know what it means for you to enter into this world and to come alongside us and to show us how and to fix the brokenness for us. God, I'm so thankful for the lessons that you have taught us through this. I look forward to being able to gather again next week. But God, I hope that through all of this we have seen that you have been faithful to your promise that your church will not fail. Be with those that are hurting. Call to repentance those that need to be turned away from their sin. Thank you for giving us yourself. I pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. of
lightning rolls the thunder. Blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise King. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing, Praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. I'm filled with wonder. Struck wonders at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath of living water, such a marvelous mystery. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything and I will adore you.